thank you for joining us for today's webinar next generation ops in shipping my name is raghavendra and i'll be in the background answering any of your technical questions today before we begin i would like to give a brief overview of our webinar console to ask a question go to the q and a panel at the lower right side of your screen type your question select all panelists from the drop down menu and then click send if you do not see the q and a panel at the bottom of your screen select the icon with three dots then choose q and a we encourage you to submit the questions throughout the session to preserve confidentiality questions will be read by our team and will not be attributed to you we will do our best to get to all the questions during the q and a portion of the briefing but if you are not able to get an answer for you today we will uh, follow up via email if you experience any technical difficulties during our session please use the q and a panel to request assistance now i would like to invite each of our speakers to say a quick hello hello big bird hello hello fox hi everyone hello benjamin so without further ado let me introduce our first speaker for the day big bird big bird the floor is yours thank you uh, good morning i would like to welcome all of you to our session to our webinar on next generations operations in shipping i'm big bird boom i'm partner with mckinsey uh, since 15 years with the firm um leading our operations practice for transportation and logistics clients having served over uh, shipping companies and other logistics companies in over 30 uh, countries and i lead our knowledge initiative on next generation um, operations so very excited to be with you and interact with you in the next 60 minutes hi this is fox partner of mckinsey hong kong office i'm one of the uh, co-leading partner of the global ports and shipping practice uh particularly in this region that is asia i've been serving uh sectors these sectors in the growth agenda mna operations turn around and many of the digital ventures very happy to be here meeting new friends and old friends my name is benjamin i am a project manager based in stuttgart germany i focus on operations work in shipping and logistics and on how analytics can help make better decisions great uh, can you turn to the next uh, slide please so um what we have uh, created and you will see this uh, throughout uh, the session we have some live poll questions and you will find a drop down menu on the right hand side uh, where you can actually then um go and um give your answer so uh, we have a well diversified audience today representing different sectors and companies and would just like take a quick poll on uh, what the audience looks like today so if you can just um answer this that would be quite helpful while we are waiting for the answers there is of course no one size fits all solutions and the solutions of course needs to be contextual what we are however trying to do today is there are some big ideas that we believe can be applied to many different um situations um which we would like to present today. So with that, let's see um, what the composition um, of this webinar is going to, do, going to be. Good. So we have a majority of people from um, Tribalk, quite a number of people from uh, freight forwarding, which is interesting, um, and then 13% each from container shipping and diversified uh, shipping companies a very interesting uh, mix and well diversified audience and with that i will hand over to my colleague fox who is going to talk about why we believe it is very crucial to get the next generation operations right in shipping as we were hi everyone uh, again uh, welcome new friends and no friends uh, from various subsectors of the sectors uh, in the next uh, 30 40 minutes uh, here is what you will hear from us To start with, I will set stage uh, to get a common understanding of where we stand. So basically, it's a quick look back of what we have done. Then to articulate why it is very important uh, to have a next level of operations improvement 
in the current and future situation. Then Woodward and uh, Ben will share with you what are the key levers and the impact, and I will conclude to tell the learnings from this and other industry and see how the successful corporations has navigated this change. Let's have a little bit of look back. <laughs> year 2020 was not an ordinary year. I'm sure you will agree to this. In the same month last year, nobody could even imagine what we have experienced in the past 12 months. In the context of shipping, the market has been facing huge volatility and also operations complexity. At one point, there was a supply constraint due to COVID, while at the other point, you're very worried about uh, whether or not the demand will be enough or whether or not there will be demand shock. In the case of container, Freeway has reached rocket high, uh, and it's not just price, but in terms of operations complexity, basically everybody is trying to fight for containers so that they can get their shipment shipped. So in the next Q&A, you can ask any questions except asking us to get a container for you. <laughs> With that backdrop, I'm sure a lot of friends here and knowing today, uh, those from shipping lines, basically they, they had a very good year, I believe. The industry has uh, reached a record high profit of 15 billion USD a year, and forwarders are enjoying the uh, proportionated spread. That is container. Dry bulk is relatively uh, less dramatic. Uh, we hear this next message. We experienced higher than expected import, import of coal to China, while we also heard of the, uh, the local sourcing of iron ore, which definitely have uh, implication of the, um, of the, of the price of uh, dry bulk. If you look at this matter from the mid to longer term, uh, you look at the order book, you look at the industry's hesitation of placing orders due to the uncertainties of decarbonization, there could be reasons to be more hopeful positively uh, for the future supply and demand balance. In the case of tankers, I, I'm sure the first half of the year will be very memorable to many of you. Uh, ships are, it's not ships, but ships are actually storage, or temporary storage <laughs> for crude oil. But after that, uh, back to the fundamentals, um, there was huge drop of uh, demand, and therefore you see there's a decline of, uh, of the rate which basically uh, 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 created a lot of challenges for, for, for many of the friends here. So that, that's the outside in helicopter view of what we have seen in the past year. If I could uh, get a chance to hear from you about what you have done in last year, to have a quick stock take and look back, it would be great. So tell us and share with police here, how was year 2020 for your company? Very challenging, very strong, or is average with mixed uh, situation uh, despite all the values we have experienced. Can we have a look at the result? I, I read it positively. I, I'm always a positive person. So basically, there's a reason why a lot of people still could have time to attend this webinar. And these results indicate that more than 80% of us basically perform okay and very strong. Uh, and I'm sure many of those are from carrier, uh, container carriers and forwarders, and, and that's part of the reasons. And also, uh, drive out colleagues are, are, are experience, experiencing not too bad here. So, okay, so uh, sentiment is not that bad, and uh, maybe we can go to the next page to try to understand a bit more of why operations uh, is. Uh, important and even more so in the current and the next situ and the next uh, 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 couple of years, uh, which might even be the new norm. Actually, these four areas of uh, operations uh, interventions from your vessel portfolio, your deployment of accent, how you manage your supplier and your internal processes are evergreen. When we say evergreen, it has been, it has been uh, 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 scrutinized a lot of people working on this uh, for, for, for progressive improvement for many, many years. Um, however, uh, if you look back in the past five or 10 years, in a situation that it is relatively more stable, <laughs> now we use relatively after year 2020, and in an industry that is perceived to be providing commoditized product and service, very often the purpose of operations improvement 
is to improve productivity and ultimately cost effectiveness, which is a little bit boring. Important though. <laughs> but now, if you look at operations excellence or operations improvement, it is different. If you can really perform well, if you're agile, if you can stay ahead of the game, knowing where to put your accent in the relevant trade, just a little bit ahead of the game, given all this volatility, it is value creation. It is supremacy of customer service that will create not just near-term financial benefit for you and your company, but a very lasting advantage for your company. That is why operations improvement is important. In the case of uh, vessel portfolio, again, we're not talking about just having macro assessment of what type of ships, when to place your ship in the order book uh, would be deterministic of your P&L, but also in a highly volatile environment, if you could predict the demand on a weekly basis and therefore relevantly position your capacity, relevantly set up your commercial and pricing mechanism, this would create huge potential of upside. In the case of XAC deployment, given reliability has been very bad, worse than ever in the past 12 months, XAC deployment is no longer just cost saving on network planning, on bunkering saving, but if you can be 5% or 10% more reliable than your competitors, apparently that turn into not just commercial benefit, but brand equity and customer loyalty and, and the ability to switch customers from your competitors. In the case of procurement, originally a lot of people talk about cost saving, bulk purchase, capacity planning, and offloading some of the risk to your suppliers, the feeder, the trains, and all these kind of suppliers. But now, how can you mobilize your supplier as a network to create transparency to your internal like organization and therefore maximize the orchestration for a better customer service would definitely create an advantage to you and your customer. Finally, internal processes. Yes, there's huge benefit by adopting automation, LPA, and stuff like that to improve your cost base in SGNA. But for now, with the ability of transparency and collaborate within your organization and your customers, and thereby providing visibility to your customers to manage their supply chain, will be seen as advantage differentiation over your competitors. So therefore, operations improvement is no longer just for cost saving, but to extend that, it could create game, game changer advantage for your company. But what are the levers? What is next level per se? Whitbird and Van will share some of the examples with you. Thanks, Fox. Um, and while Fox talked a lot about the uh, value and also the recent challenges in operations. The good news is that there's also a lot of advancements that open up new tools and levers to address these challenges and create the value that Fox referred to. In this chapter, we want to show you some examples of how increased availability of data and new technologies can really help get to the next generation of operations in shipping. Um, so with, within each of the operations areas where we can see uh, challenges, be it evergreens or, or recent ones, there are also a number of advancements, uh, way more than we could list here. So this is just a, a small selection to give you uh, an, an illustration. Um, so on network, um, <clears throat> on network and asset portfolio, we now have a much more granular perspective on trade. There's geospatial analysis that helps you uh, look at position of every vessel on the world at a given time. And together with the computational power to test millions of network combinations, this really can bring your, your planning of your portfolio on a network to a new level. We will see an example of how all of this plays together in moving from a simple ad hoc chartering um, model to basically setting up your own short term network to increase efficiency. On asset deployment, which is all about how do I make 
most use of my vessels, vessels, both from a cost perspective, but also being right there on spot when a good opportunity arises. There's a huge variety in data, both in terms of the granularity and time resolution of it, as well as the, the range that it covers. And it goes from um, very hyper-local information on weather, wind, waves to help you pick the optimal route to a real-time view on port traffic, terminal activities, other approaching vessels. Um, you, there are insights on what is being paid for a certain cargo on the other side of the world right now. And you also have outside in information from satellite imagery, for example, on stockpiles, which immediately point you towards um, demand patterns in your, in your customers' locations. The applications here, she endless, to name a few, there's um, the evergreen of route optimization, which with now these, um, these information and tools can be brought to a very new level. Um, it's also about positioning your vessel in areas where the likelihood of a profitable transport is much higher and hence beating the market and being at your customer before anybody else can offer. Uh, there's also a, a, an area of use case about managing delays better and, and helping make better decisions with dealing with, the, with these delays. There's predictive man maintenance and many more. On the procurement and supplier management, increasing an increasing number of suppliers is now connected to digital channels, which makes the effect the process of procurement and supplier management much more efficient and effective. Also, we see that there is increasing transparency within also shipping companies on what, is, what it is that they actually need, how much they spend, and a more and more granular view. By deploying predictive algorithms, for example, on forecasting demand on spare parts, um, there's, there are large potentials to be gained. So we will look at examples of how how those uh, advancements can be used when designing new vessels to reduce the total cost of ownership. How spend analytics and digital procurement can help get the most out of your supplier relation. Lastly, on internal processes. This is a very wide range which goes from non-industry specific administration tasks such as finance and HR, but it can also be internal decision making, such as uh, container repositioning. Right? What is common to all of uh, these is that they, these activities often entail a large number of repetitive tasks, which can be increasingly automated. With bots becoming a commodity, um, decision making can be supported much stronger by data while the repetitive task is taken out of the load so that people can focus on what actually matters most and creates value. And we will see a few examples of how automation is already creating um, or how automation is already creating value such as in order processing and uh, just automated dispatching and billing. There's also other areas in finance and HR uh, from optimal team composition to recruiting and learning to fraud detection, etc. Let me jump into the um, into a few examples here. So here we see a case of an of a company that had a large spend for ad hoc charters on their individual legs. What they did was they leveraged geospatial analysis to, to analyze all their past and, and future expected journeys and deployed an algorithm that would help them stitch together the individual short time, time charters that they were doing to a more connected journey. So now they were in a position that they would not have to pay higher rates for just the, the short ad hoc charter, but they could plan well in advance, and they could also combine several of these journeys to a multi-leg journey, which allow them to actually do a 
more midterm time charter for that asset, leading to lower rates. For that, they did not only have to build a um, algorithm, but it also meant that there was increasing collaboration needed from different department, departments, of, which previously each one of them had been working independently. And now they combined and joined forces and shared that asset across different parts of the organization, um, leading to impressive cost savings. At the same time, um, this also improved their um, the utilization of those vessels and helped them generate further value. Plus, they could they had more planning uh, certainty since they were on full control of the asset. They were not depending on another party releasing that vessel. In the next example, which is on asset deployment, the shipping operator was struggling with how to best deploy its assets. Um, they wanted to exploit rate volatilities and offer capacity in times of very short term demand peaks and benefit from those higher rates. To do this, uh, they built a model that was based on price, on historic price series of a hundred of routes. They analyzed more than a million voyages uh, from different vessels, seeing where did they go and where does demand come from go to. They leveraged insights per customer, such as production volumes and announcements. And with all of that, they built a huge complex model to forecast demand for each of the sub-segments they were serving, pointing them to more attractive opportunities. So by that, there were the decision makers now had a tool that would point them to geographies, the areas, the ports where the likelihood of, a, of an attractive load was much higher. And this led to a significant improvement of the results while at the same time simplifying the decision making process. This next case is, it's actually one of my, it's my favorite because it's so surprisingly simple yet effective. What this shipping operator realized is that on comparable routes for comparable vessels, there was a large spread of fuel consumption, even over time, considering whether it was just different. Ultimately, the captains would make decision, the final decision on how to, how fast and, and, and where to go and what the exact route would be. So what they did is they created a continuous monitoring and tracking of the consumption and speed and, and trim and weather conditions of each of the vessels, integrated that into a nice application and played back the results to the captains of the vessels. Now that they were now that they saw the those numbers, a very interesting dynamic happened. Suddenly the captains started competing with each other on who would have a better fuel consumption performance. So they were not necessarily advised on how to do better, but just by seeing the impact of their actions, this already drove change in behavior. As much as 1% in fuel spent, which is huge given the, the share of the cost base that uh, Bunker has, has it at the end. And with that, I will hand it over to Victor to talk about the procurement and supplier management example. Thank you. So the next area where we see that technological change um, is uh, leading to a new way of working is procurement. And this is actually particularly true for shipping companies where the organizations typically span across the globe. A procurement is done very locally and the spent items are not known. I mean, spent items not being known is a common problem also across um, other industries. But of course, it's very hard if you don't know um, the spent by category, the spent by supplier and so on um, to optimize the spent. So, um, Spend intelligence tools and spend um, analytics tool can actually overcome to help to overcome these uh, challenges um, by plugging into the ERP systems and extracting the data um, automatically from the systems. Um, 
the spent data can then be benchmarked and enriched with supplier data to perform um, uh, category um, opportunity analytics, for example, linear performance pricing analysis, clean sheeting, and um, things like that. Uh, the impact of all of that can be significant. And uh, just to give you one very simple example, a client of mine, after introducing spend intelligence tools, they actually figured out that their spend with their preferred suppliers was actually much bigger than they had anticipated. And this just entitled them, or and essentially they were entitled to volume discounts. And just like uh, claiming that additional volumes would give them a double digit million dollar saving. The tools, these tools can also be used to manage the procurement KPIs to actually manage vendor compliance and also to track savings from um, saving related initiatives. So another client of mine, they used these kind of tools to track the allocation of their third party feeders um, to um, what they, their desired allocation to just make sure that they would actually go always with the cheapest supplier to minimize cost. Can you go to the next page, please? Another um, a problem that is frequently observed in shipping companies is Maverick buying, emergency buying, buying outside frame agreements um, or outside um, free agreed rates. So what we actually see um, increasingly is that companies, organizations are moving to Amazon-like uh, catalogs that are updated um, real time so that an internal customer can actually go into that catalog um, look um, what the demand is that she he or she needs to wants to procure, uh, press a button, and then essentially the uh, procurement process is uh, being conducted. And why is that um, helpful? It's of course helpful to um, get red tape or like minutes, um, reduce the administrative burden from the procurement process, but more importantly, it's also helping to reduce the spend. So we actually deployed um, or introduced a tool like that for a railway company where we um, uh, where they actually put on this catalog 20,000 different um, spare parts. And by doing that, um, they actually reduce the Maverick, sp Maverick spend in the local um, uh, stations quite significantly. And even more important as a byproduct, the impact that they achieve by reducing the inventory um, in the decentral warehouses and the freight cost associated with shipping around um, the spare parts was even bigger than the procurement savings. So quite a lot of the impact that could be generated by implementing these types of tools. The third game changer um, are digital RFP tools that actually run tender processes in an automated way and also do the required bit analysis. And this is like very um, important implications on the procurement uh, process. Of course, you can automate the process, but even more important, so this is also helping you to generate additional savings. So one example includes a container shipping client of mine that is spending several billion dollars on transportation. And for example, in North America alone, they were dealing with roughly a thousand trucking companies and 10,000 different um, O and D pairs for their door-to-door -door product. And what they used to do is essentially renegotiating the trucking uh, spend and the trucking suppliers on a state-by-state -state basis, but they would never be able to do like a nationwide uh, tender to like tender all the routes at once. And then they started doing this with leveraging the digital um, RFP tools, which actually helped them to administer this huge tender which would otherwise not have been possible. But even more so, um, those tools help them to actually analyze um, the responses by leveraging the built-in analytics functionality and determine the best supplier allocation, which at the end led to 10% savings on the entire tracking spend, which was actually quite significant. And while these tools can generate value, as we were just demonstrated on the very small, dispersed, granular spend, 
there's also something to be gained at the very other extreme, which is in big capital expenditure projects such as new vessels. And what, uh, what, what we see increasingly here is that in there, there's tremendous value in the design of new vessels, which comes from two components. Number one is in detailed modeling of certain specific components, such, such as really optimizing what is the optimal number of cylinders that I need for the for the deployment pattern I foresee for this vessel, giving load and, and speed and expected weather requirements, and combining that with the total cost of ownership perspective, where all the future costs over the vessel lifetime are taken into account from a maintenance perspective, from a cargo pairing perspective, from a um, from a fuel and auxiliaries cost perspective, and balancing that versus the investment cost of a more or less sophisticated um, feature. Combining all those features can create um, significant savings every year for over the entire life span of the vessel. What is needed for this is a individual modeling of different of different components and more importantly, how they interact with each other. Um, but once this is, is done, that this, this tool can then be repeatedly used for different uh, CAPEX projects as well. In our last operations area, the, the internal processes, there's a large range of tools available to develop and um, improve internal processes. Yeah, they range from um, simply executing macros on well-defined workflows over natural language processing to interactive call and chatbots machine, uh, uh, which is all driven by, by machine learning. As the machines are becoming increasingly smarter, um, fortunately it doesn't take a, a, a scientific degree to use and operate them. However, with, with all these developments, there is a surprisingly large share of also white collar tasks and that can be automated already now or in the near future. There's to give you a couple of examples of what this already looks now in different logistics and shipping companies. Um, there's a, a one of one shipping line action deploys a a bot that uses natural language processing to translate more than 90% of their incoming orders via email directly into the ordering system, taking off out a huge amount of work that would have been done other, uh, other than that by, by manual labor. So this patch just now can focus on, on optimizing the cargo mix rather than just processing incoming orders. Um, another logistics player actually identified more than 1,000 tasks and steps in their system, which can, which could easily now be automated, and they are building increased ecosystems, which in which the the bots take over the the majority of repetitive tasks, and and the uh, the the workers focus on those exceptions, which then also leads to less error in the standard tasks and much better service and, and, and customer satisfaction for the exception. As Wigbert said in the very beginning, there is no one size fits all. Each of those cases is just an example. It depends significantly on the sub-segment that, that you operate, your individual business model, the unique company situation, it always needs tailoring. And it's not that those five examples are the ones to go for first. But truly believe that the those digital analytics tools hold other potential in any situation, and particularly large in shipping, since compared to other industries, there's even more potential to catch up to what digital leaders are doing in, in other industries. What we see throughout industries is that companies which are digital leaders 
in deploying those tools in our top quartile in, 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 in leveraging advanced analytics also exhibit significantly better financial performance. This is true for across industries, and it's certainly also true for shipping. Now we have uh, seen a lot of examples on what next generation operations can yield. Now the question is, how do we actually get there? How can we make it happen? Fox and Wigbert will take us through that. Right. Um, well, I'm excited and uh, I look at the numbers. These are not uh, single digit incremental changes, but these are big numbers, right? From 1.5x uh, to uh, 6x uh, of revenue uh, impact. Um, so I, I, I hope you, you same as me, you got, you got excited by, by these uh, uh, numbers and, uh, and the possible impact that you can create to your company. But, but uh, alongside the, this excitement, uh, there's a chart that may make you feel uncomfortable. Um, yes, uh, there are a lot of great ideas and in that this industry is not lacking great ideas. But uh, if we look at uh, the chance of success, when you talk to more than 100 uh, organization for the C level to review whether their efforts on analytics has been successful or not. Unfortunately, um, just 30% of those would call their uh, efforts uh, a victory, can scale and sustain. And interestingly, while we are very excited about all the uh, technological interventions uh, where we could get the best scientists, data scientists, which surprisingly just contribute to 3% of the success. Rather, it is the fail or the deliver impact from this technology intervention, the failure in really triggering a cross-functional, cross-organizational um, uh, 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 change, and the fa failure to create cultural change are the real reasons of failure of this project, which are accountable for 90% of the reasons. From this chart, my read is, is a bit ruthless. My read is 50% of the efforts or the 50% of people could not tell why and the impact to do all these projects. 35% of those could not really scale the impact across different functions. And 39% of those efforts may just be spotty, sporadic and once off because there's no cultural change happened across organization. And back to our industry, we are having a, co a organization that is cross uh, geographical with a lot of different functions and many of the stations are having different p &L calculation. This makes us even more difficult to create impact out of these many great things. But the more difficult it is, the more precious for those winners who can get the benefit out of that. Next page is a synthesized message of how successful companies navigate the change. The upper part of those is the mechanics. Successful companies very often have a clear strategic roadmap of what they aspire to do and set a very ambitious target out of this analytics or digital or operations improvement program, double digit double the profit, aggressively improving market share against competitors. Then there's a very solid execution of use case and celebration of early success. Then cross geographical, cross functional to scale the program will be very important. And underneath, supporting that is the relevant talent. It's not just technical skills. We need a thinker, not doer. We need driver, not follower. This is other personalities and characteristics of talents we want to drive this program. We want HR delivery. Trial and error, experiment. If it's successful, its MVP is great, scale this. And finally, let's be honest to ourselves regarding the technological backbone, the integrative data, because it is the fundamental of success. This is a check box you can check. Don't scare by how ready and how unready you are because 
the, the, the benefit and the outcome would definitely be worth uh, the experiment and pursuing this. So tell me and tell us, out of this journey, where you stand? Are you still thinking? Are you charting your strategic intent and roadmap? Are you trying out some use cases and have early success? Or are you already adopting this and scaling this across your organization? A few more seconds before right. we can show the results. All right. So we're not that bad <laughs> as compared to the, the industry range, a lot of those are at the stage of uh, of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of adopt, adopting and scaling. And it is one, a quarter of, of, the, of the audience are at that stage, which is, which is quite encouraging. And, uh, and uh, there's reason to believe this portfolio exec would have good performance. What I'm trying to say is good performance from 1.5x to 6x of your top, top line uplift in the near future if you can really successfully implement and scale this. And how does success look like? You wanted to bring this alive with one example from the airline industry to just give you some inspiration. So this is a case example from a sizable um, North American airline with roughly 150 aircrafts, and they generated 5,000 gigabytes of data on every single flight. And they were asking themselves, I mean, we have so much data, what do we actually do with it? And they're actually struggling to extract the value from all the visions of data that they had. So how did they go about it? So first, they defined a vision, a bold vision. So their bold vision was to become the globally leading airline in um, leveraging advanced analytics. They looked at all the business domain opportunities and prioritized the use cases by according to value and according to visibility. Then what they did is they start with a proof, started with a proof of concept. They established the governance. They defined um, the data strategy and the technology architecture, and they then got going. They started with a pilot in their air cargo business on load prediction and route pellet optimization. They targeted a three to five percent um, uplift in load factor, and they achieved eight percent, which of course got them super excited. And they then, after this, I mean, first success, were very keen to like continue and to scale um, the program. And they, it took them a year and a half to actually um, build a center of um, excellence for advanced analytics internally. So what did they do? So they then um, looked at their roadmap and thought, how can we extend the successful cargo use case to other domains of their business? So the next thing they looked was crew, crew demand, uh, sizing and crew planning, which are big use cases for airlines. The next um, domain they looked was operations excellence, where the, there was a big short-term opportunity in optimizing um, uh, operations when something goes wrong, which happens, of course, uh, quite often at airlines, which you all know. And the other use case in operations they prioritized was fuel, case, fuel analytics optimization. And the fourth domain, then they went into the commercial area. So they created this roadmap. And what they actually did is they built up this internal capability of um, data scientists following a standard, more or less standardized approach in like going after use case after uh, use case in a way together with the business to ensure that not only a use case is being done, but actually the requirements of the business are clear. It's actually um, developed together with the business, um, an MPV is actually put in place very quickly, and then the impact comes in also very quickly, and then the use case is being professionalized. And that's what they are doing now, use case by use case, until they have actually um, reached their target picture. So quite an inspiring case, as I think, um, and also a big success in terms of a bottom line uh, that they have achieved. So now, um, what are the key obstacles to overcome? And I think we touched upon a few already. 
based on our experience, there are six key potential pitfalls. And I will start at the bottom. Lack of top-down leadership. It's of course clear if you want to embark on a journey like that, that leadership needs to be on board. Otherwise, it's simply not worth the effort. Um, that will also help you to overcome a silent approach. If leadership is behind it, they will of course ensure that um, a more holistic approach can be taken and um, a lack of cross departmental collaboration can be overcome. What we often see, there is of course a lack or resistance to change. And of course, um, having senior management commitment can help, but what is even better is to create a lighthouse that speaks for itself um, so that everybody gets excited that there is um, great stuff ahead and that they actually want to follow and do this also in their respective departments or domains. Then I think what is important, and we touched upon it a few times, is to track the impact and to make sure that you get actually the impact in the P&L um, to sustain it over time and to make sure it's really happening. For that, of course, you need to actually have a set of KPIs, you need to track it, you need to have an appropriate governance to really make sure that things happen. The last two, I think, are interesting. Um, poor IT and data infrastructure. This is the first thing or one of the things that we hear when we talk to clients as the key obstacle that they think um, going on such a transformation needs to be overcome. What we see from many uh, or from most um, of our transformation that we have supported, this is of course a topic that needs to be looked at and it needs to be planned in. But in most, almost most instances, this is not a huge roadblock. It's nothing that can be not overcome. And it's also typically not very costly. The last point, capability building, this is probably the crucial one. I would not recommend to actually embark on such a journey with having the intent to build capabilities in-house because this is a capability that you need to own within your organization so that you can actually scale the impact over time, that you can actually add additional use cases if things change. Um, um, this is probably the most important um, point that I would like to highlight here. So with that, um, I would like to ask you what are your largest challenges and what has been um, most difficult so far. And uh, this time it's a little bit different. So we would like to ask you um, to submit your answers in the chat. Others will not be able to see it. And then we'll try to summarize what the common themes are that you see in your uh, organizations. So um, maybe while we are waiting, there's um, a question from the audience, which I can cover now. Um, how long does such a journey take? Of course, it's dependent on the specific situation, but what I say, it should not exceed maybe one and a half or two years. That's also what we would see is in line with larger companies going on that journey. If it takes longer, I think it's unlikely to happen. Um, it is very crucial, I mean, to have like a concerted um, action um, so that it keeps the priority of the leadership. So I would say maximum one and a half years. Do we have any um, indications on um, the key challenges from the audience? Because I cannot see it here. Okay, so then uh, maybe um, we'll cover them um, as part of the um, Q and A, uh, because we have been getting uh, quite a few um, questions. And the next question um, that is uh, coming in is what's the best way to get full buy-in from the leadership on digital transformation? So I think um, what we have seen working best is to actually engage leadership in a discussion to um, get them excited and also showing them what the size of the price is because the value that can be created is um, uh, significant. So one of the things is um, to basically go through the key potential use cases um, that might be applicable for your organization, try to roughly size it so um, that you have an idea of what it is, what the major use cases might be. Maybe look at um, other examples that you see from your industry or maybe neighboring industries. And what we also find um, quite helpful is actually to take your management team and go and see um, other organizations 
that are further on the journey, it might also be from other industries, might also be more tech heavy uh, companies. But typically what we see is that this is something um, that is creating a lot of excitement um, to get the organization started. I mean, in addition, there is of course also the notion of creating a successful lighthouse because then of course the impact is real and it's much, much easier to convince the critical people, uh, the cynics um, in the organization. So then um, maybe a, a question uh, that you Fox can answer, mm -hmm. why is the shipping industry lagging behind in digital maturi maturity and what do you believe um, should be done or needs to be done to get the shipping industry to the similar level like aviation or other industries that are a little bit more ahead? Right. I think I think um, I think for it, it's not indeed just aviation and shipping. Uh, indeed, it is a B two C and B two B situation. Uh, for B two B sectors, they are more exposed to um, direct feedback from customers. Uh, if they adjust the price, if they just different surface level, it is so visible uh, to the end customers, and the results will be so reflective to to their financial and and and, and operational performance. In the case of shipping, uh, relatively for a B2B case, these um, result or this performance uh, would relatively uh, more difficult to be reflected uh, instantly. And therefore, the urgency for change usually is perceived as not as high or not as urgent as airline. Having said that, the cost of not doing so, the cost of not improving is a lot higher in the case of, uh, of a B2B sectors, as you must heard of the so-called Boeing effect. So that that's what we have seen, but the good news is that um, after after industry has been uh, busy with uh, their agenda, right? In the case of container, they focus on M and A. Uh, in the case of dry bulk, they focus on the vessel portfolio. And after this wave of uh, efforts, I am seeing a lot of players are focusing on um, improving the surface level and uh, financial performance, and and definitely more and more momentum is being gained. So that, that's a reason to believe that more will be coming. Um, thank you, um, uh, Fox. Uh, maybe uh, while we have answered the first questions, we have also um, assessed the results that we got on the question on like what are um, the key challenges that um, the audience has in um, running and scaling such transformations successfully. And the key uh, two points that we got is it's a siloed, often a siloed effort, lacking cross-departmental collaboration, and also a lack of um, top-down leadership. Uh, um, with that, and there's one more question, um, which you might want to take. Um, are there any specific um, segments, like container versus dry bulk, um, that we believe have a bigger impact over others. I would say, in my mind, um, as we have tried uh, uh, to bring across, the size of the price is big regardless of the sub-industries. However, um, the use cases might be um, slightly different because also the business context is um, uh, different for the different sub-segments. Right. I, I just want to want to resonate to what the audience talk about the challenges of uh, being successful. That is one of those is top down. The other of those is uh, cross departmental collaboration. And and therefore, I would really encourage uh, audience here. If you're really serious about this, if you're really enticed by the benefit that can be gained from uh, operations improvement, it is the uh, accountability of the top leadership. Uh, to step up to lead the change and own the change rather than being an evaluator of whether it's successful or not from the functional department. It requires effort to mobilize the entire organization to strive for a very bold and aspirational target and really stretch limit uh, to emerge what is possible. Then channel relevant resources to make it happen and allow uh, uh, risk-free period uh, for the team to experiment. I, I have seen this happen and 
if that happens, it's not just financial benefit. It is an uplift of your company's competitiveness and also lasting and sustained capability for your organization and for your next level of leadership. So with that, I would like to move on to our last chart, which is um, the very last question and simple question. If you would like a follow up discussion with us on the whole topic or some of the individual topics, please click yes. If you're not interested, uh, please click um, a two. A B, sorry. Um, and with that, I would like to thank you um, all for being here, um, for listening to us, for giving us um, input through the chat. And we hope that you have enjoyed uh, the session and we are wishing you um, a very nice day.